Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, to those of you who are joining us again, welcome back to the JGU alumni webinar series. Um, it's been quite an incredible journey through 21 uh, different sessions of this series so far. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to both congratulate and thank all of the alumni who have been part of this series. Um, and we've had incredible conversations with them. Uh, thank you also to uh, my dear colleague, uh, Assistant Professor Shireen Moti, who has contributed hugely to making this series a great success. Um, what's been really exciting is not only to see our alumni working in so many different fields, right, from um, public health policy to immigration law to um, transfer pricing law to competition law, um, to grassroots advocacy, to international mediation. Uh, but I think an important takeaway of this uh, webinar series and the reason why it has, um, it, it's, it's so relevant to a wider audience beyond just JGU is that it has really captured um, the evolving opportunity landscape for young students, young Indians, who are looking at getting their um, higher education in the social sciences and professional fields. Um, so I think that's been one big takeaway um, of this webinar series. Today is the 22nd edition, and it's also our final edition for this year 2020. Um, and so we thought we would leave things on a, a very topical issue, but also on a hopeful note by discussing um, research in action the role of grassroots organizations in driving social change um, with a wonderful alum who's here today, Mr. Atharva Mehinde. Um, I'll say a bit by way of introduction uh, before we start the conversation with Atharv. Um, Atharv is a recent graduate of the Masters in Diplomacy, Law and Business uh, from the Jindal School of International Affairs. He's currently associated with the North India and Afghanistan zone of United Religious Initiative, um, a San Francisco based global grassroots network. Um, he has previously worked on research and community development projects in Delhi, Assam, Meghalaya. He holds prior research experience uh, in migration and mobility, conflict management and developmental anthropology. Um, his book, Community Chronicles, Volume 1, was published in August 2020. It explores the role of not-for-profit organizations in community development and peace-building processes. Very recently, we've welcomed Athar back as a fellow to JGU. Um, so we're very happy to, for him to now be on the other side and actually be working and contributing to JGU um, as a member of, of staff. Um, Great. So, Atar, welcome. Um, it's really nice to have you uh, back and to be having this conversation um, with you. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. And it's, it's really been a privilege for me to uh, be a part of this webinar series because uh, this is a way that I can probably give back or contribute uh, to the institution that has uh, given me a lot over the past two years. And uh, to be very honest, I am a little nervous because this transition from uh, being a student uh, to being an alumni and now to being one of uh, the staff members was very fast, uh, to be very honest, because I, I just graduated uh, in the month of August. I wrote my dissertation um, in May. I defended it and then I graduated in August. And um, I, I was given this opportunity to apply for the fellowship program. Uh, that uh, JGU has recently started. And uh, since I was keen on joining academia in the future, I thought this was a wonderful opportunity to, for me to, uh, uh, you know, pave a path in that particular direction. Uh, so yeah, I'm a little nervous, but very excited to uh, share my thoughts and to talk with you. Thank you so much. Okay, fantastic. So without further ado, let me ask you first um, to kick off the conversation. If you could, um, Tell us a bit about your journey since graduation. And while you're walking us through that story, if you can also reflect back on what were some of the important moments, some of the 
uh, inspiration that you took from your time as a master's in diplomacy law and business student that led you down this path? Right. Uh, so I think when I look back uh, to the year 2018, I had recently graduated uh, with a BCom degree uh, in commerce, and I was also uh, pursuing my CA, that is chartered accountancy. But somewhere I was not very comfortable with what I was doing, and I did not uh, probably see myself doing that uh, over the long course of my career. And I was looking to make a switch uh, to something that interested me, uh, something that was uh, you know, more in line with what I wanted to do um, in long run. And uh, while I was looking at opportunities, uh, the, the field of international affairs and political science uh, struck me as something that uh, I was interested in. I did not have a lot of um, idea about what that would entail two years down the line and um, how probably the degree would pan out. Uh, but then I think I, uh, I, I took the faith of leap and uh, leap of faith and I uh, registered myself uh, for the MADLB course. And to, to begin with, I think, uh, you know, there were the initial hiccups uh, in the program because I did not have any background whatsoever uh, in humanities. And shifting from uh, making tax statements and uh, accounts to writing long research essays was not uh, something that was very easy. And a number of my batchmates were actually from the humanities background. So I uh, had a bit of a struggle to adjust in. Uh, but I think uh, the the interdisciplinary approach to instruction that is usually followed at JG where, uh, you know, people from all backgrounds are uh, made welcome and comfortable uh, when it comes to the master's program, because I think it addresses uh, the issue that there are people um, who have varied backgrounds who would want to pursue uh, international affairs or development as their career choice. And so I think the courses uh, as a part of the degree were very uh, flexible, I would say. And uh, though the first semester was a bit challenging for me to adjust in, but I think I, I really found my ground uh, second semester onwards where I could choose uh, elective subjects of my choice. And um, I think the one elective subject that uh, really uh, did the job for me and uh, helped me develop interest in uh, the fields of IR or uh, probably even uh, development, uh, if I'm if I'm to be broad, was uh, the elective that I took under Professor Suganda Nagpal from uh, JSIA, uh, which was migration and transnationalism, and I think that was something that uh, you know sowed the seeds of my interest uh, in issues around uh, migration, informal sector studies. Uh, the uh, development studies and uh, also other related aspects like urban policy, grassroots organizations. So I think that was uh, the turning point that um, helped me really uh, set foot, um, I think, in the degree. And uh, um, I think what followed was um, a beautiful continuation of, uh, of my, uh, my research interests where I was um, in my third semester given the opportunity to uh, carry out uh, primary research uh, in the states of Assam, in Meghalaya, uh, and also in the border areas of Bhutan, uh, and also uh, to some extent, some amount of primary research in uh, Sonipat and other parts of Haryana, where I could actually explore uh, my, my research interests in migration and development which then really strengthened uh, what I was interested in. Um, and apart from that, I mean, the opportunities that uh, JGU as an institution has given me um, in the form of being able to contribute uh, to the institution building processes and uh, initiatives of the university, like uh, being a part of uh, an international relations society, which uh, JSIA runs, uh, and also being able uh, to contribute my share to the um, Committee on Gender Sensitization Against Sexual Harassment, which is uh, the Anti-Sexual Harassment Committee in the university. I think all of those experiences also um, greatly helped me in shaping uh, myself and my uh, career trajectory um, in, in a particular manner. Um, and I think this beautifully culminated uh, in my fourth semester where I was 
able to write my master's dissertation again um, on internal migration in India. And that was, um, I think, uh, the result of all of the experiences I've had uh, from JGU as an institution uh, over the period of two years. Uh, it, was, it was a wonderful experience writing the dissertation, defending it, though mostly all of it was uh, online because we moved uh, to our respective homes in March and we had to do most of our research work while at home. Uh, but even then, I think uh, it was a wonderful opportunity and I'm truly thankful to Jeju as an institution for all the opportunities that it has given. Very well said. Um, you actually touched on a very important point, um, Athar, which is uh, when you said that you were from a commerce background and right. then you really came into this uh, really multidisciplinary social sciences uh, program at the graduate level. Right? Right. Um, what would you say? So a lot of a lot of our a lot of students in India. I mean, you know, the the sometimes they are just pushed into uh, or they find they feel at tenth or twelfth standard level that they should go into the sciences, right? Right. Right. Um, and then later on, this kind of either this interest develops or from a career advancement standpoint. They decide to pursue higher studies um, in, you know, maybe one of the social science or humanities fields. What would you say to um, students like that based on your experience? How would you encourage them to pursue this? What would you say that they should be prepared for? What were the kind of changes you had to make um, in the way you thought about issues, in the way you presented your, 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 yourself, in the skills uh, that you had the opportunity to develop? and what is the difference you feel in yourself, in the way you think, in the way you approach questions from back when, you know, you had just started out in the MADLB to now? Right. Uh, so I think something that I would like to uh, share at the outset is that um, when I graduated from uh, commerce, uh, in, in commerce, I thought uh, it was too late for me to, you know, make a shift in something that I was really interested in because uh, the, the bachelor's degree is something that really builds a foundation for you, for, for what you want to do in the future. And uh, though I thought it was too late for me to make the shift, um, I think um, it, now that I've studied in the MADLB program for two years, um, I think it's never really late uh, to make the shift and to study what you really want to. And um, because, and, and institutions like JGU and uh, interdisciplinary courses, uh, really help you in that process. Um, and I think people who are from uh, sciences um, or mm -hmm. medicine, engineering, or even uh, commerce for that matter, um, do have uh, a number of opportunities available uh, for them these days. Uh, people I know uh, who are not specifically from the humanities background, but are involved uh, in activities that, you know, do make them aware about this, like uh, Model United Nations or um, other online courses, uh, which are uh, abundantly available these days, thank you to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. I think um, if, if there is someone who, uh, you know, would want to make a shift from uh, a stream that is completely unrelated uh, to humanity, uh, it would be, you know, a great idea to actually uh, find courses that are related to this, introductory courses, to try to just understand, not for the sake of certificates, obviously, but to try to understand what um, this, this field entails and what they would be getting into if they were to choose this. Uh, and I think that uh, did greatly help me because I, I remember when I graduated uh, in 2018, uh, I did a couple of courses um, on Coursera and uh, that was very scary for me, uh, to be very honest, because I did not understand how the things that were happening. Uh, but uh, I was somehow interested in uh, what the professors on the course were saying. And um, I think I am glad that I made the shift. So uh, courses or Model United Nations or other forums that help people to uh, you know, talk about issues like these um, are, I think, a great platform for someone who is wanting to start out uh, in the humanities field. So, yeah. Great, so moving on, um, tell us how you got into the whole 
URI space, the United Religious um, Initiatives that you that you uh, that you've now been working with, uh, yeah. that you published your book uh, with, yeah. um, and also just uh, the vision behind the book, uh, yeah. the process through which it um, came about, and what sort of impact you would uh, like to see it have. Right. Uh, so I think even my association with United Religions Initiative was uh, due to the university because uh, URI as an organization very closely works with the Digital School of International Affairs. Uh, URI has had um, a couple of peace building workshops as well uh, in the university. And uh, it was through that uh, that I was able to uh, be a part of the organization. I joined the organization not very uh, long time ago. It was in February of this year. And um, it was uh, one of my colleagues, actually, uh, Krupa, who introduced me uh, to this organization. And uh, what then, uh, you know, I, I was then gotten into contact with uh, the regional coordinator uh, who works at the North India and Afghanistan zone, uh, Ms. Subhi Rupar. Um, and she had a project in mind uh, which she wanted me to work on. Uh, so before before that, uh, I think I would it'd be wise to you know let our let everyone know what URI stands for. Uh, so URI is um, a, a San Francisco-based grassroots organization that essentially creates a network of uh, smaller NGOs and smaller CSOs which are working in local areas. Uh, which do not have that kind of a geographical impact to, uh, you know, impact policy per se, but are very actively working with communities at the grassroots level. So what URI does is it creates a network of all of these smaller organizations uh, for effective dialogue and communication between these organizations to then maximize their social impact and to then also essentially talk about uh, policy implications of how these organizations can contribute um, if a network of theirs is created. Uh, and URI is present in 108 countries uh, worldwide, and it just it recently celebrated its 20th anniversary uh, in 2020. So uh, I, I got onto this project, which was, so Community Chronicles was not the name that we had uh, in mind. It was uh, something that came up towards the end when we were working on the book. What initially the project entailed was that um, I was supposed to uh, visit uh, these smaller NGOs uh, uh, in, in Delhi, in other parts of North India, which were close to Delhi, and also talk to NGOs working in Afghanistan, uh, since it was not possible for me to actually visit them. And uh, I was to visit them, I was to understand their work, how, they, how, their, work begin, how their work began, uh, the communities that they've been working with, and the kind of social impact that these organizations have been creating at the grassroots level. I was to talk to the, uh, the uh, people that work in the NGO and to understand their story and to write their stories in the form of an article. So um, all of these articles that I wrote over the period of the last seven to eight months were um, you know, uploaded and published on the URI Global website as well, uh, individually. And I was not obviously able to uh, talk to all of them in person because uh, in, in March, the COVID-19 pandemic struck. So I was actually able to visit only two or three of the organizations and the rest, uh, rest of the interviews were carried over um, a telephone call or a Zoom conversation like this. And I tried to understand their stories. I wrote articles on them. And it was in the month of July that um, we thought of actually collating all of these stories together and uh, to come up with um, a booklet of sorts which would then bring all of these stories together and help them find a wider audience. Uh, so that was when Community Chronicles as a book and as a project was born. Uh, the first 20 stories were uh, published in the form of the first volume and uh, there's a second volume that is uh, coming up soon. Uh, so we are working on the editing process of the second volume currently, and uh, we expect to release it uh, sometime next month. Uh, 
Um, and uh, if I were to talk about probably the impact that we hope that this project would have, um, is that we would want to um, uh, you know, create a foundation for further policy support, for further policy advocacy. Um, we are trying to, what we're trying to do here is we are trying to um, help these organizations uh, uh, maximize their social impact, maximize their reach, uh, maximize their, uh, the reach of their work, and uh, to collaborate all of these organizations to work on um, issues that we are seeing in society currently. So there are organizations that work um, in the areas of women empowerment. There are some that work in the areas of uh, child empowerment, education, peace building, policy advocacy, poverty. So the aim of this project is essentially get all of them together and to try to find out um, if a common ground can be sought in order to um, then liaison with uh, government authorities at some future stage uh, in order to translate the work that they've been doing over a period of time um, into something more concrete at the government level. So this is what the, uh, the premise and the basic idea behind uh, the, the project is. Fantastic and congratulations on the great work so far. Looking forward to Community Chronicles uh, part two. Uh, I do want to ask you, I mean, it's just a fascinating collection of uh, so many different case studies. Um, I do want to ask you about two in particular and also kind of link them to some broader themes uh, that I would like to discuss with you. Uh, the first of these being the Choti Si Koshi um, grassroots organization, which you have highlighted uh, in the right. um, which uh, basically is working around um, education in the urban setting. Right. And education focusing especially on children who are in and out of the education system because of certain disadvantaged circumstances. Right. Mm -hmm. Just keeping in mind, you know, our uh, listeners today, some of them might be wondering, um, what is a guy who studied diplomacy and law and business in a school of international affairs? What's he doing um, in all this grassroots stuff, right? Right. So I want to ask you, while you talk a little bit about uh, Choti Si Koshi and your experience there, um, how have you found yourself in reconciling your more global training, the more sort of high level, theoretical, analytical aspects of your training in your degree program um, and translating them into the local reality, the local circumstances that you encounter? And how should one imagine that nexus between global and local in a broader sense? Right. Uh, I think that's a very interesting question. And uh, I would want to start with, uh, you know, telling everyone about what Choti Si Koshi as an organization has been doing. Uh, so it is, it is a grassroots organization that is primarily working in the sectors of uh, urban poverty and how urban poverty can be translated um, into um, education-based action. Because, um, I mean, the COVID-19 pandemic has also uh, put forward a number of issues uh, with respect to uh, migrants, with respect to the informal sector of the economy. And um, a number of people who find themselves to be a part of the informal sector and families that they bring, around, that they, that they bring in uh, from rural areas of the country to cities like Delhi, cities like Mumbai, they find themselves living on the urban fringes, uh, so to say. Um, they uh, find themselves living in the peri-urban areas. Uh, they find themselves in difficult situations without um, adequate access to uh, uh, public utility services, without um, adequate access to um, even ration at some point, because um, uh, when people move from rural areas or from their uh, hometown, to a city, unfortunately, um, the distribution of uh, public services is linked to uh, the, the ration card, uh, which is linked to your hometown. 
So when you actually move to um, a city, you do not have adequate access to services provided by the government. And uh, which is why these, these, uh, these communities find themselves in a very vulnerable situation. And uh, with, with very limited access to public services, education really takes a backseat in communities like these because um, even children of migrant workers are forced to contribute to the family's income, uh, which is why they are not really able to uh, educate themselves, uh, find even primary source of education. Uh, so I think Choti Si uh, has been working in this area to uh, make sure that children like these uh, who live in urban slums, uh, children of migrant workers, are able to uh, get access to primary education uh, because the organization, I think, firmly believes in the fact that uh, education is something that would transform these communities in the long run uh, because it would then, uh, uh, then let these children uh, escape this uh, whole idea of poverty uh, that they are trapped in and education would actually help them to you know, escape out of it and grow out. So that is something that uh, Chodi Sikushi has been doing. And um, I think how this uh, relates to what I was doing or how I was able to make a connection uh, was that when we study um, international affairs or uh, uh, international development, we study about a number of issues that um, are cross-cutting, that are present uh, in most of the uh, global south countries, so to say. And uh, we study about the problems of migration, we study about the problems of uh, the informal sector, and um, um, how the informal sector then blends in with the economy as well. And uh, studying these at um, a very global perspective um, helped me actually understand how that would also translate at the grassroots level when I was already when I was actually able to talk to these organizations. Um, I, I was very surprised to know that what I read in my um, textbooks about probably um, a similar problem of poverty or a similar problem of migration um, in an African country. Um, had the same effect and um, the same impact at the grassroots level uh, when I was actually able to view the problem firsthand uh, in Delhi. Uh, so I think uh, it is really necessary uh, for courses like um, the master's course in diplomacy, law and business or any other uh, course in international affairs or even development to have a strong focus on uh, grassroots implementation because uh, issues like these uh, are the ones that translate into our textbooks at, at a very broader stage. Um, and uh, there's something that I would want to bring in here uh, when in December of 2019, when under the MADLB program, I was given the opportunity to uh, travel to Assam and to Meghalaya to understand uh, patterns of internal displacement, to understand patterns of uh, migration, cross-border migration between Assam and Meghalaya and also uh, we, we were situated and placed in uh, the border areas between Assam and Meghalaya and also uh, the border area between uh, the international border area between Assam and Bhutan and also Assam and Bangladesh. So we were really able to understand how the migration networks work um, between states and also uh, levels of illegal migration between countries. And I was, I, I actually did have a question um, back then when I traveled to Assam that, uh, you know, I was studying international affairs, but what I was doing was traveling to uh, villages in India uh, to try to understand what was happening and how would this actually connect to what I was studying. Uh, but I think uh, processes like migration which happen between states and at an interstate level have the same nature, um, I would say, uh, with migration processes probably happen between uh, international borders. And I think that really connects interstate migration uh, to, to an extent to the refugee problem as well. I mean, I wouldn't compare it directly because uh, internal migrants move within the country uh, for economic and other reasons. 
and refugees do uh, you know try to escape uh, persecution and other problems and try to move to seek asylum in another country but the whole mindset i think that goes be, uh, behind the uh, migration process and the creation of refugees uh, was very similar so to say at the fundamental level and uh, understanding that at the grassroots level uh, really helped me in um, translating it to a broader level and to help me understand the concept that i studied in my uh, in my degree better so um, i think and and even the courses that i did as a part of the degree um, helped me move beyond the usual scope that ir as a discipline offers and um, i think jindal has a great contribution to make in this regard because we were allowed to take uh, elective subjects across schools so I, i took an elective subject from the law school as well which is international refugee law um which really helped me um you know understand um how uh, disciplines like law disciplines like public policy um like economics and journalism really tie in uh with international affairs and international development um so i think that i was with that i was able to translate and uh, of grassroots action to what i was studying at the degree level fantastic i think you made some very important points right there thar which i really really want to kind of highlight uh, and put more plainly out there in the context of today's discussion first is you know studying global does not mean you ignore the local right, right? an understanding of the global is not never comes at the exclusion of the local um and should not it should very much be grounded in the local and in a similar way a training about global developments without with, with, because we are living in such an interconnected world focusing on local developments alone also is insufficient right uh because then you're only getting the partial picture right. right sort of imagining that things are happening in a vacuum and you're missing out on all these big picture global developments which are having a definitive impact at the local level right right, right. so while it's important to understand that just because you're studying international affairs doesn't mean kind of local manifestations are of of uh world affairs are of no consequence to you right right, right. Other, uh the other thing which you uh very quickly mentioned but is worth highlighting is that um it matters where you study international affairs also right you studied a program like uh, MADLB uh, in a school of international affairs that's based in delhi ncr in the state of haryana right um that's that's it kind of brings a flavor to it uh that you would not get elsewhere you know uh that brings a kind of character to it uh that brings a kind of context to it the opportunity you mentioned that you got to go into uh our northeastern states um you know all of this comes together only in a in a certain environment and how we approach international issues is very much conditioned by what our circumstances are close to home you know so where you choose to study international affairs also greatly shapes your overall experience your approach to the discipline what you feel you are able to do moving uh, on going ahead going forward with your training so um all of this perspective that you're sharing um is really great i think for people who are trying to even understand still what a training in international affairs is really all about um anyway we we'll start And, um i think i would like to add a point here before we move on um i think the covid-19 pandemic has really blurred the line between local and global to a great extent because uh, this problem that we are all currently in um is something that's worldwide there there's no country in the world that has been spared and what probably india is doing at the grassroots level to combat issues of the covid-19 pandemic uh are you know imitated by other countries india is imitating other countries uh, in doing so so i think uh, what is happening at the local level in each country um is manifested at a global level where uh, 
you know countries are trying to come up with the best solution in order to tackle this pandemic so i think in situations like these um the the relationship between local and global um really plays out and um the understanding of local issues um in a course that uh, teaches you international affairs uh, becomes really really important in this context Great. So um, I can see that our attendees have started submitting some really interesting questions. I'm going to come to those in a second. Before that, I want to ask you about another story um, in the book, um, which is about the initiative Light Up, uh, an initiative dedicated to mental health um, mm -hmm. and also uh, taking a, a novel approach of uh, addressing mental health issues among the younger demographics through uh, investing in emotional intelligence, right. Right? taking that kind of approach uh, to the mental health issues. Um, in this context, in the context of the story, I want to uh, just ask you, um, did you find yourself having to engage with these issues in a really interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, critical sort of way? And uh, what aspects of your training helped you there? Uh, but also, how was that training in its own way um, for you, in a sense of, you know, not thinking about things in silos or in very uh, kind of narrow disciplinary, uh, through very narrow disciplinary frameworks, uh, but really something like mental health uh, in, a, in a grassroots sense, the, the the kind of um really range of lenses you need to to use to even unpack and understand something like that so could you reflect on the issue of interdisciplinarity in the context of uh light up things right uh so i think um what light up is doing at the grassroots level um, is something that's very important and also uh, unlooked at in the broader sense when we when we talk about NGOs or CSOs working at the grassroots level. Uh, mental health is something that uh, to a great extent is considered to be um, an elitist concept. People uh, who probably um, are, you know, belong to a very higher class of the society or are well off economically um, talk about mental health, but talking about the same at the grassroots level uh, is something that is still considered to be a taboo. Uh, in in most communities across uh, across India, and um, I think talking about these issues at the grassroots level is really important because I think this this again connects to the problems of the informal sector, connects to the problems of migration because um, kids like these undergo a lot of trauma when they move from um, their villages uh, or their homes back in their hometowns to a big city where they are expected to adjust. Uh, in the new environment, uh, where they expected to adjust to uh, probably a new situation uh, of of poverty, of limited means, and not being able to gain a sense of uh, individuality through education for themselves. So, uh, in such situations, uh, and also people, um, kids who are um, addicted to drugs or use drugs, um, are you know, fall into this trap because of all of these reasons that I mentioned. And then it gets really difficult for them to uh, find a way out uh, to be able to find a grounding or a footing again. And I think uh, organizations like Light Up are uh, doing an excellent job in uh, trying to translate what mental health awareness means at the grassroots level to um, bring in professionals uh, who are working in the space of uh, art, music, dance, and to get children like these to talk about their problems or just to talk about life or, um, you know, have someone listen to what they want to say. Um, I think that goes a really long way in trying to understand what problems uh, people face at the grassroots level. And using media like um, art, craft, or dance really helps um, kids open up about their problem and uh, talk to these professionals that are working at the grassroots level. And um, 
I think interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity here plays um, a very crucial role uh, because, like I said, psychology or mental health awareness is uh, something that we do not see translating at uh, a grassroots level, and bringing that to the uh, concepts of local development or economic development, and trying to understand how effective mental health communication or effective mental health awareness can actually go a long way in boosting the local development uh, trying to understand that um, i think the uh, contribution of interdisciplinarity really comes in and um, here again i would like to uh, bring in the point that i made earlier about uh, being able to um, take electives across schools um, um, I, though i was not um, able to take electives from uh, the Jindal Institute of Behavioral Sciences. I had um, a couple of friends who did actually take um, courses in psychology as a part of the international affairs degree. And I was, I, I was really questioning myself and my friends uh, at that point in my second semester when they took courses in psychology. I, I was not very clear about how a course in psychology would help you uh, in understanding global problems or even uh, international affairs for that matter. Uh, but when, when I was able to explore that um, and how it translates at the grassroots level, and not just the grassroots level, but when you're trying to understand situations of war and conflict, and um, you know how psychology or mental health awareness uh, plays out in the um, situations of war or post-conflict uh, reconstruction, or uh, problems of refugees and dis displacement. I think mental health plays a very important role and ties in really closely um, with global politics or uh, international development or international affairs as disciplines. Uh, so it is really, really important to, to try to understand how the interconnection between um, issues from psychology, issues from economics, uh, issues from conflict transformation play out and how we can borrow concepts from all of these disciplines to really come up with a um, concrete plan in order to address social issues at the grassroots level. Yeah, um, I think what I also loved about what you said, Atharva, just now was that it's not just about having the interdisciplinary training. In fact, when the rubber hits the road, it's also about creatively interpreting that to suit the local context um, and to adapt all that understanding, all that insight, all that knowledge to the problem at hand, to the actual question that you're trying to address. Uh, great. So with that, um, <clears throat> I want to turn to uh, some questions from the audience. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we are seeing a lot of active participation from the audience. Uh, since we have just been talking about the book, I'll start with questions about the book. A um, couple of questions related to uh, Community Chronicles. First is, Atharva, will you kindly elaborate uh, on the most memorable moment uh, while being part of this project and what astounded you the most? And then the second question also related to the book, is um, there are several grassroots organizations who work on similar lines, um, as I think you are I. Uh, <clears throat> most of these organizations try to come up with versions of advocacy and policy making. They try to create awareness via their work and strive to implement their policies to change the grassroots realities. Therefore, how is your book Community Chronicles different from others? And what do you do to achieve? Uh, what do you, what do you do? What to do to achieve uh, this? That this publication. What do you think this publication can achieve? I think is what they're trying to say. Uh, other than generating awareness, I think related to this, if you can also touch on on the aspect of since this this project was under the aegis of URI. Uh, is there any faith-based or kind of religious um, element to their approach that probably distinguishes this in, in the context of this question? Right. Uh, so I think I'll begin with the first question that is uh, my most memorable experience 
as a part of this project. Um, I think uh, my most memorable experience would be the very first uh, interaction that I had with a grassroots organization as a part of the project. So um, I traveled, uh, this was back in the uh, first week of March when I traveled from the university uh, to uh, a peri-urban area of Delhi, uh, which was close to the nearest metro station that is Hedakur Badli. And uh, that is when I interacted for the very first time with someone who was working at the grassroots level. And when I, I was um, actually talking uh, to the person and trying to understand what work that they've been doing over the period of uh, time, um, with the communities, I think um, it, 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 dawned, it was a dawn of realization that what I was studying um, in my books and um, as a part of my courses was actually being translated at the grassroots level. And um, there were aspects that probably I did not study as a part of the course, um, practical aspects that um, I wouldn't have ever understood if I, um, you know, uh, would have not been able to understand this this dimension of practical application. Uh, that was something that was very memorable and it stayed with me for long. And I think that was also something that motivated me uh, to uh, conduct the remaining of the 40 interviews that I did over a period of uh, uh, seven to eight months. And um, with every interview that I uh, did, uh, I was, I tried to find the one point of connection that I could with what I had studied and how then that would translate and how I could probably be um, able to use concepts learned in class to make the article better. So whenever I wrote about um, any particular organization, I always made it a point to address the larger issue that the organization was working in and was working with in the introductory paragraph. And then I tried to then highlight what the organization has been doing in that regard. So uh, in doing so, I tried to give uh, each article um, a kind of a perspective, which would uh, also bring in elements of um, research and global policy and how that is um, translating at the grassroots level is something that followed. Uh, so I think uh, that was a, a very memorable experience that I had, my very first interaction with uh, a grassroots organization, and then the rest followed. Uh, I think I'm gonna refer the question, the second question again in the comment section, because uh, it was too big let for me, me to understand. Let me, let me give you the gist of it. Right, uh, right. The crux of it was, uh, there are a lot of publications which highlight what grassroots organizations are doing. What would you say is distinctive about community <laughs> And what is your hope for the contribution it can make beyond just raising awareness? Right. Uh, so uh, when we started with this project, we were aware that, uh, you know, there are a number of organizations working in this space. And uh, there are a number of articles that do talk about these issues that uh, do highlight the work that these organizations have been doing. Uh, but what we noticed and figured out was that uh, most of these organizations have a very limited geographical impact. They work in one particular uh, probably community or work in one particular slum, uh, an urban slum um, in Delhi. And while they are able to create um, a very important and significant impact in that particular community, they are not really able to uh, translate that impact uh, to probably the larger problem in order to uh, address the larger problem at hand. And um, I think like I mentioned earlier, uh, the Community Chronicles project is, um, is a project that lays down the foundation for uh, the work that URI would want to do um, in the next couple of years. So this project merely highlights uh, stories of these organizations and the work that they've been doing. The next step uh, probably in this uh, project going ahead would be to try to understand what common point or common ground uh, we can come at. So there are, uh, you know, organizations, there are a number of organizations that work for education. There are a number of organizations that work for child, uh, child empowerment. Uh, there are organizations like Light Up who work for um, 
mental health awareness so our next step would be to uh, you know try to understand how to bring these organizations together uh, where we can come up with uh, a policy focused approach as to bring in concepts of um, education poverty eradication and mental health awareness to come up with uh, concrete policy solutions uh, for problems like urban poverty uh because these organizations cannot really um lobby uh, if that's the right word on their own for uh, effective transformation or effective changes in the policy so what uri as an organization since uh, it's an international organization um and working with a number of smaller organizations is trying to do is to is is a hope to bring uh, the work of all of these smaller organizations together to try to come up with a concrete plan and um, what we also hope uh, to do through these projects is that uh, to uh, maximize the reach of uh, these smaller organizations and to provide them a sense of uh, boost um, in a way that they can uh, reach out to a wider global audience uh, who are now reading these stories who are who are uh, reading the community chronicles project so there are similar uh, regional offices so i i am associated with the north india and afghanistan regional office so there are similar regional offices all around the world so um, this this would obviously be um, something that uh, would be a number of years down the line but um, you know trying to start a dialogue about um bringing smaller organizations together for policy advocacy is something that we aim to do so i think this is where uh, this project and uri's work uh, is slightly different from the other articles i've mentioned so i may also suggest atharva um since you are doing such solid uh, grassroots work so such you have such a good hold over the field um maybe you could also consider how this should reflect back into some theoretical perspectives right into some kind of more formal knowledge creation because um as you know you know a lot of the um textbook kind of wisdom or textbook knowledge that is imparted is so divorced from um these realities right so how do we take our exposure to what's current and what's on the ground um and make sure that we are revising um and making a contribution at the knowledge creation at the epistemic level right. um, because i remember you know i did my masters in social work uh from delhi university and we had compulsory field work uh in addition to in the summers and winters we had compulsory field work uh twice a week every tuesday and thursday we got on a bus and we went somewhere off in uh the far reaches of delhi wherever we were placed and we volunteered all day um and then we came back to class the following day and we were just taught you know very us centric very western centric uh frameworks of social work theory and action um so you know the two were so kind of divorced from each other so one thing definitely uh to consider is how that how does not only research impact practice but how does practice again uh reflect back into research and the entire exercise of knowledge creation um, right so um i think to add to this um i think this is a very insightful point that you uh, brought in here uh what we are trying to also do at uri at some point is that when when we want to try uh, towards going into probably policy advocacy um is uh, something that uh, we are trying to come up, trying to come up with um, a very research uh, research focused approach to doing this where um, we would try to involve these grassroots organizations um in the creation of resources um resources in the form of um research papers uh, in the form of um other articles that would help translate this grassroots action into also uh, something that um, is is a written word and we are you are also trying to uh, act 
some stage in the future partner with um, other universities uh, which are working in uh, you know delhi ncr and north india to uh, try to get students who are uh, studying courses like these or not just courses like these courses across disciplines uh, to be able to um, view problems at the grassroots level and uh, to take back some form of um, insight to their courses that they've been doing uh, so this is also something that we have in the pipeline which uh, will be happening sometime in the next year um in the form of some 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 sort of a, a research based and a, a grassroots based fellowship program for uh, university so that is also something that's uh, in the pipeline so that is something i wanted to share uh, to this point great so now coming back to questions from the audience um very interestingly there are two questions about engaging with difference right okay um first question about difference is how different uh is textbook from your real life experience example what type of hindrances did you face when you went to assam and meghalaya and how have you grown as a person also related to difference another question um here is atharva what were the common challenges that people or organizations face while dealing with people of different backgrounds in societies so okay. um so i think uh, when it comes to the difference between uh, textbook and practical implementation i think there certainly is some form of a discord uh, like you rightly mentioned um, about uh, the western view of uh development that is also taught uh, to students in in the global south in in asia in countries of asia um i think uh, though the fundamental problem and the fundamental principle behind it remains the same um the implementation at the grassroots level does change according to the particular um local context the the geography the uh, cultures traditions that are present in that particular uh, local context uh, so i think there is that one key difference between uh, textbook and between uh, grassroots implementation is that sometimes what we study uh, especially uh, when it comes to global policy is that we study a very western centric uh, view of development while it is uh, same fundamentally um it would be beneficial to um, and it would be helpful rather to uh, talk about these issues that are actually happening at the grassroots level in that particular local context and that would i think contribute uh, to the study of um, international relations as a discipline and also global policy as a discipline to understand how these problems that we are studying are translating at the local level Uh, in the country that we live in uh, so uh, that was one point and um, how are these about how are these organizations trying to work with people from different backgrounds um, i think this is also something uh, that uri has been working with uh, so uri actually stands for united religions initiative and when it came up in the year 2000 uh, it came up with the view of uh, bringing people from different faiths together in order to use religion as a tool for peace building and community development because um, religion very sadly um, is used uh, in a very negative sense these days it is used as um, a tool for uh, uh, creating differences between communities so what you are also tries to do, tries to do is that you is to tries to use religion as a tool to create a sort of social impact and get religions together and um i think all of these organizations that have been working at the grassroots level have been able to do that very effectively um uh, because uh, i mean i've i've had experiences of talking to um people working for these organizations and the actual people who work on the ground um they've told me stories about how uh, religion at the grassroots um 
doesn't really matter when you're uh, addressing problems like education or addressing problems like um, uh, probably poverty eradication because these problems are uh, very similar irrespective of what background you're from or what faith you ascribe to or what traditions you follow and while addressing problems like these um, it it would it is wise usually to uh, not include um, these differences and not get these differences into play but rather um, using uh, these differences in a way to uh, mobilize people in in a way to um, use these differences for the greater good um, so i think at the grassroots level though uh, the initial entry uh, into these communities is a little difficult because people do not really trust organizations uh, working in the social sphere uh, and gaining that kind of trust get really difficult for these organizations but when uh, this trust is built over time to their action um, that is when uh, the, the work really begins so yeah okay uh, the next question from the audience goes back to something we briefly touched on when I asked you about your commerce background and the transition to MADLB, the question is, can you throw some light as to how one can start preparing for a course like MADLB? Um, what you did maybe from undergraduate level. Uh, should one get into forums or participate in research competitions? So I'll let you have a go at that first, and then I will also have a couple of things to say on that. Great. Um, so to be very honest uh, with everyone, I did not uh, really get into a lot of these things because I was really confused uh, when I graduated with a degree in commerce as to how um, a degree in international affairs would pan out. Though, like I mentioned, I did um, uh, enroll myself, myself for a couple of online courses just to understand what uh, this field entails. I was uh, I, I was not able to participate particularly in um, research competitions or even in uh, model United Nations or anything of that sort. Um, but I think humanities is a field that is very close to uh, reality. So and when I say this, I, I do not mean that uh, you know other fields are not close to reality, but this is something that, um, we see translating in the society on a daily basis. Uh, when we talk about um, streams like political science, or we talk about sociology, or um, philosophy, or even um, international relations, uh, we, we see that playing out every day uh, in our day to day lives uh, in the society that we live in. And uh, once you study, or once you take a course uh, in, in the humanities, um, I think you get that lens. Uh, to be able to um, analyze how the society works and how it can then be traced back uh, to what you've learned um, in the discipline. So obviously, uh, uh, research competitions like the question mentioned or uh, online courses or, or other such forums which have other such online forums which have really come up uh, and have gotten a boost um, in the times of the pandemic would definitely help. Uh, to gain a sort of a background in what this entails. But even if you are completely clueless and you get into the humanities, uh, you just need um, a sort of an open view uh, to understand what uh, education translates at the local level or what it translates in the society. Um, so I think yeah, that, that, that would be my answer to this. Uh, that's a really good question and um, I would like to make a couple of suggestions uh, in response. First of all, uh, overall general awareness of what's going on in the world uh, is supremely important. What do I mean by that? First of all, do not rely on your Facebook news feed for your news. Um, actually watch three or four different news channels uh, international and national, actually read newspapers, whether you read them online or in print. Um, read a lot, just in general. 
I mean, for graduate education and uh, for graduate education in the social sciences in particular, um, you know, a lot of uh, just basic skills of reading and writing are uh, supremely important um, because it develops your analytical thinking um, and it, it, it enables you to start seeing things laterally, right? To make connections between different pieces of information, between different ongoing events. And that's how you develop your ability to be analytical and be critical and actually contribute to ongoing debates and discussions. Uh, so one thing is just general awareness and a kind of voracious appetite for um, reading and for what's current and for staying on top of that. Uh, the other thing is uh, learning a foreign language. I cannot emphasize this uh, enough. I tell our students at JGU all the time who have the opportunity to learn several languages at our Global Language uh, Languages Center, uh, that you know, uh, your high school and undergrad years are the best time to learn a foreign language. Um, and a language is not just a skill, it is an access to a worldview. Right. And I would I would go further than that and say, do not just just uh, prefer European languages. Right. Like usually we we opt for French or German or something like that. Try your hand at Arabic. Try your hand at Mandarin. You know, Spanish is one of the fastest. It, it is a European language, but Spanish is one of the fastest uh, growing languages uh, in the world. Uh, so be very savvy about where the world is moving. Um, and also like the last thing I will say is to understand, I would encourage you to understand the difference between an undergraduate education and undergraduate degree and a graduate or what we call in India postgraduate or master's degree. Um, an undergraduate degree is more about conceptual grasp over your discipline. Right. So really work on that, especially if you're already someone in the social sciences, studying the social sciences, uh, make sure you work really hard on your conceptual grasp on the basics and on the foundations of your of whatever discipline you're in at the undergraduate level. Um, and graduate education or postgraduate, as we call it in India, is about a finding your niche and be about developing your own way of thinking about things, right? So it's a big difference. It's not about digesting something which is there in some textbook. It's really about uh, developing a global awareness and a holistic way of thinking about and analyzing questions and being very much applied and solution oriented in your thinking through that. So that's one big difference between um, the transition that, that occurs um, when you go from being an undergrad to being a postgrad. Um, and I would, I would, I would absolutely to the attendees of this session, those of you who are students, I would highly recommend, um, that you consider any international affairs program. Uh, probably I would, I would encourage it more at the postgraduate level, having done your undergraduate in some other core discipline. Um, you know, there used to be a time maybe 10 years ago where international affairs was thought of as um, something that you did if you were if you wanted a UN job, right? Or if you were a UPSC aspirant at the most, you know, so it was considered to be a very limiting uh, option meant for meant for very kind of specific type of, of people. Uh, but clearly looking at Atharva today, we know that that's no longer the case, um, that a global training, a training in international affairs, a training in global affairs is relevant really to everybody who is, who's looking at any, you know, working in any kind of field um, today. Um, so I think we have addressed uh, more or less the questions from the audience, which were fantastic. So thank you. Um, well, no, there is one question that has just come up from uh, our dear Shireen, uh, who says, thank you for this wonderful discussion. I would like to congratulate Atharva for working on such important issues and for publishing an important piece of work so early in his career. My question to Atharva is, 
how does he think higher education institutions can contribute to grassroots movements uh, to deal with important social issues? That's a fantastic question. Did you ever find yourself, Atharva, thinking about what universities can do about all of the uh, spectrum of initiatives uh, that you have encountered? Right. Uh, so I think universities do really have an important role to play you know, because uh, they are the ones that shape uh, leaders of tomorrow, so to say. Uh, so um, I think uh, something that JGU has been doing uh, through its uh, research centers is in some way uh, uh, trying to translate um, research into action. Uh, I was personally involved in um, a primary data collection oriented research project uh, under the Center for Migration and Mobility Studies at JSIA, where we tried to understand uh, migrant aspirations and how these aspirations tie in with uh, the interaction that migrants have with the locals and how then that influences uh, their socioeconomic mobility. So I think research projects like these uh, can form a base, I think, um, in uh, influencing and in creating uh, a medium for dialogue. And also if these research centers uh, are more practice oriented, um, and also if there are, uh, there are courses uh, either taught at the undergraduate or the graduate level that do have um, one part of, uh, you know, practical application or practical implementation, um, so, I mean, like, like you rightly mentioned, there are very limited courses that do actually have field work. So uh, social work being one of them, uh, you're the best person to talk about it. But even courses like um, political science or courses like uh, international affairs that do to a great deal talk about um, issues of development uh, should have courses that are uh, to a great extent focused on grassroots uh, implementation because uh, merely studying about global development without understanding how that translates at the grassroots level would um, make the course uh, very one dimensional uh, in its approach. But when you have um, courses that do have um, a sense of uh, groundwork or a sense of um, primary data collection um, or um, using the primary data in your courses uh, on research projects. I think that would be an excellent starting point. Um, so probably more practical, practice oriented courses in the university to sum up, if I could say. Well said, um, great. Before we call this to a close, I must ask you, Atharva, um, we're really excited to hear what you have going on now and uh, can only imagine all the wonderful things you're going to be doing. So what does the, what does the near future have in store? And uh, any final words you would want to close out this interaction with? Um, so firstly, uh, what, what I see for the future is, and I'm really excited um, because I will be joining JGU again um, in the capacity of a research fellow. Um, and academia was something that um, I developed interest in uh, over the period of two years uh, uh, during my time at JGU. And research was something that I was uh, keenly interested in. And to be able to join JGU again um, in the capacity of a research fellow uh, is, is really um, exciting for me. And uh, I think I would, um, would want to continue um, engaging in research around migration, research around urban policy. And uh, I'm also really excited to be able to, uh, to an extent, um, engage myself in um, classroom training and classroom interaction, because that is also a part of the fellowship program, um, a tutoring. So I am I'm really excited to join Jindil again for the next two years. Uh, and I uh, really hope that this is an enriching experience for me. And I really look forward to working with uh, you all very, very soon and uh, interacting with all the current students there. And uh, with respect to uh, URI, that is something that I've been doing for the past uh, seven months. It, it, it's not, uh, I do not see that as a, uh, as a job because that is something that I've been doing freelance. 
uh, over the past seven months. And I think that is something that I'll uh, uh, keep doing to some extent, um, even in the coming months and years. Um, so that I've already discussed about what uh, research projects we intend to get into uh, in the coming months. So yeah, I think uh, the future sounds very exciting for me right now and I cannot wait for the 5th of October when I actually begin with the fellowship program. So, and I would like to really thank you to, for letting me speak about all this. Uh, I think it was a really enriching experience for me. Atharva, it's been our pleasure. Um, we thank you for sharing the energy and the inspiration and all your amazing experience with us here today. Thank you to the audience for participating um, actively in the session. As I said, this is the close of our 2020 um, alumni webinar series. Um, succeeded my expectations talking to you, Atharva, and having a great discussion with the attendees. Um, thank you very much to you all. This has been an initiative of JGU's Office of Alumni Relations, um, and we will be back with several more inspiring, engaged initiatives, um, not just for our alumni community, but linking our alumni community to our current students and to um, the wider community of knowledge seekers out there. So do stay tuned and thank you for your support. Have a nice thank evening. Thank you so much, everyone.